Hello and welcome to this exploring session. This is a second look exploring session at Thomas of Woodstock, the uh, uh, as it is uh, variously known. Um, but generally, we're calling it Thomas of Woodstock because it's the most appropriate title. Um, and today we are doing a second look at this play. We've already done a first look at this. It was fabulous and lovely. Uh, we've done some workshopping on the play and that also was fabulous and lovely. And now we're going to do a straight run through of the first two acts and uh, get a sense of the flow of things. And we're going to be continuing that across the week in part because it's towards the end of the year. It's Christmas. This is our sort of Little, little final big, big flourish before we uh, we get we go into a, a slightly lighter schedule. Um, so, reading today, the first couple of acts of Thomas of Woodstock, we have in the room uh, reading King Richard the Second is. Hello, I'm Gloria. I'm an actor and a newly qualified Spanish interpreter as well. Very happy to be here. Uh, surrounding Richard, like like. Paris, the parasites that they are, uh, is green. I don't know what you're on about. We're lovely people. Um, Liza Graham, actor, singer, and Renaissance text coach, two actors in London. Also in that uh, cohort, we have Bagot. Hello, I'm Dan. I'm an actor from Montpellier, France, and you're just jealous. And <laughs> also we have Bushy, who is... Hi, I'm Lynn. I'm a college writing teacher. I live in the Northwestern United States and Bushy is a wonderful person. And uh, and uh, slightly further down that pecking order, we have Scroop, Sir Thomas Scroop, who's played by. Hi, I'm Eric. And yeah, uh, I have all my scruples in place. Um. <laughs> Please unscrew them now. Uh, and uh, reading uh, 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 another one of the, this this band of reprobates, decide amongst yourselves. Uh, reading Tresillian and also the uh, the fine upstanding uh, citizen of the Duchess of Gloucester is Alexandra. And I don't have a joke. I'm sorry. That's fine. Um, and uh, reading a nimble and and a maid is Hi, I'm Sarah Blake. I'm an actor, writer, and director living in Germany. Uh, reading the Lord Mayor, uh, Lord Mayor Exton is. It, that's me, yes. Uh, Steve Longstaff, a forgetful person, but very good with cues. And <laughs> uh, reading a uh, wife, uh, soon to be wife of uh, the Richard II, Queen Anne is. Hi, I'm Tamara. I am an actor. I'm currently still stuck in Germany. And I have no joke either. It's fine. We don't have to do jokes. Um, reading, uh, and this is the slightly uh, different selection of, of various uh, minor lords, we have uh, the Earl of Arundel today is... Hello, I'm Emma Kent. I'm an actor and I live in London. The Earl of Surrey today is... Ooh, I can't see the Earl of Surrey. Uh, have we lost the Earl of Surrey? Surrey? Uh, we will move on from the Earl of Surrey and we'll uh, leap on to uh, Cheney. Sir Thomas Cheney, uh, supporter of Thomas Woodstock, is... Hello, I'm Lois. I'm a retired academic and I think Cheney is the nicest person in this play, personally. And I think that's a contention we can probably we can probably prove or disprove relatively soon. Um, uh, now we get to the the various uncles of the uh, king. Uh, we have uh, York York, the Duke of York, who's played by. Good afternoon. I'm Alan Scott. I'm neither an actor nor an academic, and I've been marching up and down hills for years. And uh, reading the Duke of Lancaster today is... Hello, I'm John of Gaunt. I am the, by far, the most senior person in this play. I'm Helen Good and I'm in Yorkshire. Uh, and uh, trying to trying to poke at my authority, I am uh, I uh, today am uh, I'm Robert Crichton, by the way, and I will be reading Thomas of Woodstock, uh, Duke of Gloucester, and Lord Protector, um, uh, because it's the end of the year, and I fancy reading a big part. And uh, that's either going to be a great or a terrible idea, and that will be revealed very soon. Reading the Duchess of Ireland today is. Hi, I'm Rachel Nicole, an actor from New Jersey. 
and uh, 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 back back online uh, reading Surrey today is. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Amisu, and I'm an author based in Romford. And I think I've done everybody. I think that's everybody. Uh, so this is a play that opens quite dramatically. It's quite a dramatic moment. So I'm going to ask everybody, including those who are about to enter in the first scene, to disappear now and prepare for that dramatic entrance. I'm sure it's going to be very noisy and very loud, um, but uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's going to be a, a very interesting uh, time coming up now. So I'm just going to ask everyone to just take a moment, prepare yourselves for this very dramatic opening, and uh, audience at home, enjoy Thomas of Woodstock, Acts 1 and 2. Lights! 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 Torches! Knaves! Torches! Torches here! Yes. Shut to the gates! Let no man out until the house be searched! Call for our coaches! Let's away, good brother! Now, by the blessed saints, I fear we have poisoned all! Poisoned, my lord? Aye, aye, good Arundel! Tis high time to be gone! May him. God heaven be blessed for this prevention. God for thy mercy. Would our cousin king so cousin us to poison us in our meat? Has no man here some helping antidote? For fear already we have taken some dram. What, what thinks thou, Cheney? Thou first brought the tidings. Are we not poisoned, thinkest thou? You're not, my lords. That mischievous potion was as yet unserved. It was a liquid bane dissolved in wine, which after supper should have been caroused to young King Richard's health. Good faith! Are his uncle's deaths become health to King Richard? How came it out? Sir Thomas Cheney, pray resolve us this doubt. A Carmelite friar, my lord, revealed the plot and, and should have acted it, but touched in conscience, he came to your good brother, the Lord Protector, and so disclosed it, who straight sent me to you. The Lord protect him for it. I and our cousin King. I heaven be judge, we wish all good to him. A heavy charge, good Woodstock, hast thou had to be protectors of so wild a prince, so far degenerate from his noble father, whom the trembling French the Black Prince called. Not, not of a swart and melancholy brow, for sweet and lovely was his countenance, but that he made so many funeral days in mournful France. The warlike battles won at Cressy Fields Poitiers, Artois, and Maine made all France groan under his conquering arm. But heaven forestalled his diadem on earth to place him with a royal crown in heaven. Rise may his dust to glory. Ere he'd have done a deed so base unto his enemy, much less unto the brothers of his father, he'd first have lost his royal blood in drops, dissolved the strings of his humanity, and lost that livelihood that was preserved to make his unlike son a wanton king. A bad your John of Gaunt, believe me, brother, we may do wrong unto our cousin king. I fear his flattering minions more than him. By the blessed virgin, noble Edmund York, I am past all patience. Poison his subjects, his royal uncles. Why, the proud Castilians, where John of Gaunt writes king and sovereign, would not throw off their vile and servile York by treachery so base. Patience, gracious heaven. A oh, good invoke, right, princely Lancaster. Calm thy high spleen. Sir Thomas Cheney here can tell the circumstances. Pray, give him leave. Well, 
Let him speak. Tis certainly made known, my reverend lords, to your loved brother and the good protector, that not King Richard, but his flatterers, Sir Henry Green, joined with Sir Edward Bagot and that sly Machiavel Tresillian, whom now the king elects for Lord Chief Justice, what? had all great hands in this conspiracy. By blessed Mary, I will confound them all. Your spleen confounds yourself. By kingly Edward's soul, my royal father, I'll be revenged at full on all their lives. Nay, if your rage break to such high extremes, you will prevent yourself and lose revenge. Why, Edmund, canst thou give a reason yet, though we, so near in blood, his hapless uncles, his grandsire Edward's sons, his father's brothers, should thus be made away? Why might it be that Arundel and Surrey here should die? Some friends of theirs wanted my earldom sore. Perhaps my office of the Admiralty. If a better and more fortunate hand could govern it, I would to a none of mine. Yet thus much can I say, and make my praise no more than merit. A wealthier prize did never yet take harbour in our roads than I to England brought. You all can tell. Full threescore sail of tall and lusty ships and six great carracks fraught with oil and wines i brought king richard in abundance home mm. so much that plenty hath so staled our palates that, as that a ton of high-priced wines of france is hardly worth a mark of english money if service such as this done to my country merit my heart to bleed let it bleed freely we'll bleed together warlike arundel cousin of surrey princely edmund York, let's think on some revenge. If we must die, 10,000 souls shall keep us company. Patience, good Lancaster. Tell me, kind Cheney, how does thy master, a good brother Woodstock, plain Thomas, for by the rude, so all men call him, for his plain dealing and his simple clothing, let others jet in silk and gold, says he. The coat of English frieze best pleaseth me. How thinks his unsophisticated plainness of these bitter compounds? Fears he no drug put in his broth? Shall his health be secure? Oh, faith, my lord, his mind suits with his habit, homely and plain, both free from pride and envy, and therein will admit distrust to none. And see, his grace himself is come to greet you. Uh, by your leave there, room for my lord protector's grace. Health, health to your, to your grace. grace. I salute your healths, good brothers. Pray, pardon me. I will speak with you anon. Uh, hi thee, good Exton. Good Lord Mayor, I do beseech ye, prosecute with your best care a means for all our safeties. Mischief hath often double practices. Treachery wants not his second stratagem, but... Who knows, but steel may hit, though poison fail. <sighs> Alack the day, the night is made a veil to shadow mischief. Set, I beseech, strong guard and careful to attend the city. Ah, oh, lady, help, we know not who our friends are. Foes are grown so mighty. Pray, be careful. Your friends are great in London, good my lord. I'll front all dangers. Trust it on my word. <sighs> Thanks from my heart. <laughs> I swear, afore my God, I know not which way to bespoke myself for time so busy and so dangerous too. Why, uh, how now, brothers? Uh, how fares good John of Gaunt? Thou art vexed, I know. Thou grievest kind Edmund York, Arundel, and sorry, noble kinsman. I knew ye all are discontented much, uh, but, but be not so. For my God, I swear, King Richard loves you all. A and credit me, the princely gentleman is innocent of this black deed and base conspiracy. Oh, uh, but speak, speak, how is with princely Lancaster? 
sick, Gloucester, sick. We are all weary, and fain we would lie down to rest ourselves, but that so many serpents lurk in the grass, we dare not sleep. Enough, enough, good brother, I have found out the disease. When the head aches, the body is not helpful. Uh, King Richard's wounded with a wanton humour, lulled and secured by flattering sycophants, but tis not deadly yet, it may be cured. Some vein let blood where the corruption lies, and all shall heal again. Then lose no time, lest it grow ulcerous. The false Tresillian, green and bagot, run naught but poison, brother. Spill them all. They guide the nonage king. Tis they protect him. Ye wear the title of protectorship, but like an under officer, as though yours were derived from theirs. They... Ye are too plain. In my apparel, you'll say. Good faith in all. The commons murmur against the dissolute king. Treason is whispered at each common table. As customary as their thanks to heaven. Men need not gaze up to the skies to see whether the sun shine clear or no. Tis found by the small light that should beautify the ground. Conceit you me, a blind man thus much sees. He wants his eyes to whom we bend our knees. You all are princes of the royal blood, yet like great oaks ye let the ivy grow to eat your hearts out with his false embraces. Ye understand, my lord. Aye, aye, good cars, as if ye plainly said, destroy those flatterers and tell King Richard he does abase himself to countenance them. Soft, soft. Fruit that grows high is not securely plucked. We must use ladders and by steps ascend till by degrees we reach the altitude. You can seat me too, pray be smooth a while. Tomorrow is the solemn nuptial day betwixt the king and virtuous Anna Beam, the emperor's daughter, a right gracious lady that's come to England for King Richard's love. Then, as you love his grace and hate his flatterers, discountenance not the day with the least frown. Be ignorant of what ye know. For my God, I have good hope this happy marriage, brothers, of this so noble and religious princess will mildly calm his headstrong youth to see and shun those stains that blurs his majesty. If not, by good King Edward's bones, our royal father, I will remove those hinderers of his health, though it cost my head. On those conditions, conditions, brother, we agree. And I. To hide our hate is soundest policy. And Brother Gloucester, since it is your pleasure to have a smooth out, so sullen brows with smiles, we'll have you suit your outside to your heart. Yes. And like a courtier, cast this country habit, for which the coarse and vulgar call your grace by the title of plain Thomas. Yet we doubt not, tomorrow we shall have good hope to see your high protectorship in bravery. No, no, good York, this is as fair a sight. My heart in this plain frieze sits true and right. In this I will serve my king as true and bold as if my outside were all trapped in gold. By Mary, but you shall not, Brother Woodstock. What? The marriage day to Richard and his queen, and will ye so disgrace the state and realm? We'll have you brave, if faith. Well, well, for your sakes, brothers, and this solemn day, for once I'll sumpter a gaudy wardrobe. <laughs> but tis more than I have done, I vow, this twenty years. Before my God, 
The king would not have entreated me to leave this habit, but your wills be done. <laughs> Let's hie to court. <clears throat> you all your wishes have. One weary day, plain Thomas will be brave. Nay, good Sir Henry, King Richard calls for you. Sweet Green, visit his highness and forsake these passions. Blood, I am vexed. Tresillian mad me not, thyself and I and all are now undone. The lords at London are secured from harm. The plot's revealed. Black curses seize the traitor. Hell of romance whip that, Carmelite. A deeper hell than Limbo Patrum hold him. A fainting villain. Confusion crush his soul. Could the false slaver coil and swore their depths? Mischief devour him! Had it but ta'en effect on Lancaster and Edmund Duke of York, those headstrong uncles to the gentle king, the third brother, plain Thomas the Protector, had quickly been removed. Uh, but since tis thus, our safeties must be cared for, and tis best to keep us near the person of the king. Had they been dead, we'd ruled the realm and him! So shall we still, so long as Richard lives. I know he cannot brook his stubborn uncles. Come, think not on it. Cheerly, Tresillian. Here's better news for thee. We have so wrought with King Richard that by his consent, you are already mounted on your footcloth. Your scarlet or your purple, which you please, are shortly are to underprop the name. Mark me, Tresillian, of Lord Chief Justice of England. <laughs> legit or non legit? <laughs> Everything's already I sit upon the bench with dreadful frowns, frighting the lousy rascals, and when the judge when the jury once cries guilty, could pronounce Lord have mercy on me with a brow as rough and stern as surly rudiment, or when a fellow talks, cry Take him, jailer, and clap boats of iron on his heels and hands. <laughs> Justice. Lords. Hmm. 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 I will wear the office in his true ornament. <laughs> but good, your honor, as twill shortly be, you must observe and fashion to the time the habit of your laws. The king is young, I and a little wanton. <laughs> so perhaps are we. Your laws must not be beadles, then, Tresillian, to punish your benefactors. Look to that. Now, sir, to punish you, the minions to the king, the jewels of his heart, his dearest loves. Zoons, I will screw and wind the stubborn law to any fashion that shall like you best. It shall be law, what I shall say is law. And what's most suitable to all your pleasures. Thanks to your lordship, which is yet to come. Farewell, Tresillian. Still be near the court. Anon, King Richard shall confirm thy state. We must attend his grace to Westminster to the high nuptials of fair Anna Beam that now must be his wife and England's queen. <laughs> so, let them pass. Tresillian, now bethink thee. Hmm. Lord Chief Justice. Methinks already I am swelled more plump than erst I was. Authority's a dish that feeds men fat, an excellent, delicate, yet best be wise. No state's secure without some enemies. Youth will frown. Why, I can look as grim as John of Gaunt, and all that frown with him. But yet, until mine office be put on my kingly Richard, I'll conceal myself. Framing such subtle laws that Janus like may with a double face salute them both. I'll search my brain, turn the leaves of law. Wit makes us great. Greatness keeps fools in awe. My man there! Hello, where's Nimble? As nimble as an eel, sir, did ye call, sir? Uh, look out some better phrase, salute again. 
I know no other, sir. <sighs> Unless you will be Frenchified and let me lay the monsieur to your charge or sweet signor. Neither, it is higher yet, nimble. No buckram scribe. Mm. Think once again. Neither sir nor monsieur nor, nor signor. What should I call him, Trow? He's monstrously translated suddenly. At first, when we were schoolfellows, then I called him Sirrah. But since he became my master, I pared away the R and served him with the Sir. What title has he got now? I know not, but I'll try further. Has your worship any employment for me? Thou gross uncappered, thou speaks not yet. My mouth was open, I'm sure. If your honour would please to hear me. Ah, honour, says thou, I, thou hit'st it nimble. I knew I should wind about ye till I had your honour. Nimble? Bend thy knee. The Lord Chief Justice of England speaks to thee. The Lord be praised! We shall have a flourishing commonwealth, sir. Peace, let me speak to thee. Yes, anything. So your honour not pray for me. I care not for now your Lord Chief Justice. If ever ye cry, Lord have mercy upon me, I shall hang for it, sure. <laughs> no, those fearful words shall not be pronounced against thee, Nimble. <laughs> Thank ye, my lord. Nay, and you'll stand between me and the gallows. I'll be an errant thief, sure. If I cannot pick up my crumbs by the law quickly, I'll cast away my buckram bags and be a highway law in the house, certainly. Canst thou remember, Nimble, how by degrees I rose since first thou knewst me? I was first a schoolboy. I, saving your honest speech, your worshipful tale was whipped for stealing my dinner out of my satchel. You were ever so crafty in your childhood that I knew your worship would prove a good lawyer. Interrupt me not. Those days thou newst, I say, from whence I did become a plodding clerk, from which I bounced as thou dost now in Buckram to be a pleading lawyer. And there I uh, stayed till by the king I was chief justice made. Nimble, I read this discipline to thee to stir thy mind up still to industry. Thank your good lordship. Go to thy mistress. Lady, you now must call her. Bid her remove her household up to London. Uh, tell her our fortunes and with how much peril we have attained this place of eminence. Go and remove her. With a habeas corpus or a certiorari, I assure you. And so I leave your lordship always hoping of your wanted favour. Mm. That when I have passed the London Bridge of Affliction, I may arrive with you at the Westminster Hall of Promotion. And then I can. Thou shalt. Thou hast an executing look, and I will put the axe into thy hand. I rule the law. Thou, by the law, shalt stand. I oh, thank your lordship. And a fig for the rope, then. Bagot and Green, next what? to the fair Queen Anne, take your high places by King Richard's side and give... Fair welcome to our queen and bride. Uncles of Woodstock, York and Lancaster, make full our wishes and salute our queen. Give all your welcomes to fair Anna Beam. <laughs> I hope, sweet prince, her grace mistakes us not to make our hearts the worst part of us. Our tongues have, in our English eloquence, harsh though it is, pronounced her welcomes many by oaths and loyal protestations, to which we add a thousand infinites. But in a word, fair queen, 
forever welcome to let me uh prevent the rest for mercy's sake uh if all their welcomes be as long as thine this health will not go around this week <laughs> by the mass uh the sweet queen and uh cousin now i'll call you so uh, in plain and honest phrase welcome to england uh, they Think they speak all in me, and you have seen all England cry and joy with joy. God bless the Queen! And so afore, my God, I, I know they wish it. Uh, only I, I fear my duty, miss, not Miss Constant. Uh, nay, uh, nay. <clears throat> King Richard, for God, I'll speak the truth. Sweet Queen, uh, ye have found a young and wanton choice, a wild head, yet a kingly gentleman, a youth unsettled, yet he's princely bred, descended from the royalist bloods in Europe, the kingly stock of England and of France, yet he's a hair brain, <laughs> a very waggy faith, but uh, oh, you, you you must bear, madam, lassie's but a blossom hair, but his maturity, I hope you'll find a true English bred, a king, loving and kind. Thank you for your double praise, Good uncle. I, I, good cuz. <laughs> I'm uh, plain Thomas by the rude. I'll speak the truth. <laughs> My sovereign lord, and you true English peers, your all accomplished honours have so tied my senses by a magical restraint in the sweet spells of this your fair demeanours that I am bound and charmed from what I was. My native country I no more remember, but as a tale told in my infancy, the greatest part forgot, and that which is appears to England's fair Elysium, like brambles to the uh, cheddar's schools to vine, or like the wild grape to the fruitful vine. And having left the earth where I was bred and English made, let me be Englished. <laughs> they best shall please me, show me English call. My heart, great king, to you. My love to all. Gramercy, Nan, thou highly honest me. Blessed is England in this sweet accord. Oh, for my God, sweet queen, our English ladies and all the women of this isle contained shall sing in praise of this your memory and keep records of virtuous Anna Beam, whose discipline have taught them womanhood. <laughs> well, what erst seemed well by custom now looks rude. Uh, our women, till your coming, fairest cousin, did use like men to straddle when they ride, but you have taught them now to sit aside yet by your leave young practice often reels i have seen some of your scholars kick up both their heels <laughs> what have you seen my lord nay nothing wife uh, I, I i see little without spectacles thou knowest Ooh, trust him not aunt for now he's grown so brave he will be courting i and kissing too nay <laughs> uncle now <clears throat> i'll do as much for you and lay your faults all open to the world. I, I do, do. <laughs> I'm glad you are grown so careless. <laughs> now, by my crown, I swear, good uncles, York and Lancaster, when you this morning came to visit me, I did not know him in this strange attire. Mm -hmm. How comes this golden metamorphosis from homespun housewifery? <laughs> Speak, good uncle. I never saw you hatched and gilded thus. I am no stoic, my dear sovereign cousin, uh, to make my plainness seem canonical, but to allow myself such ornaments as might be fitting for your nuptial day and coronation of your virtuous queen. But were the eye of day once closed again, upon this back they never more should come. Mm. Oh, you have much to you have much graced the day, uncle, but, but noble uncle, I did observe what I have wondered at, and as we today rode on to Westminster, methought your horse that won't to tread the ground and pace as if he kicked it scornfully, mound and curved like strong Bucephalus, today he trod as slow and melancholy 
as if his legs had failed to bear his load. And can ye blame the beast? <laughs> For my God, he was not wont to bear such loads. <laughs> Indeed, a hundred oaks upon these shoulders hang to make me brave upon your wedding day. <laughs> and more than that, uh, to make my horse more tire. Ten acres of good land are stitched up here. You know, good cows, this was not wont to be. Mm. Oh, any more t'other hose, uncle? No, nor his frieze coat, neither. I, I mock on my t'other hose, say you. There's honest plain dealing in my t'other hose. Should this fashion last, I must raise new rents, undo my poor tenants, turn away my servants, and guard myself with lace. Nay, sell more land and lordships too by the root. Hear me, King Richard. If thus I jet in pride, I still shall lose, but I'll build castles in my other hose. The king but jests, my lord, and you grow angry. <laughs> to tuck the hose? Did some here wear that fashion? They, they would not tax and pill the common so. Shrug, he walked for warned us and will break out himself. No matter, we'll back him. Though it grows to blows. Scoff ye my plainness, I will talk no riddles. Plain Thomas will speak plainly. Oh, there, there's Bagot there, and Green. And what, and of, what of them, my lord? Upstarts, come down. You have no places there. Here is better men to grace King Richard's chair, if it pleased him grace them so. Uncle, forbear. These cuts, the columns that should prop thy house, they tax the poor, and I am scandaled for it, that by my fault those late oppressions rise to set the commons in a mutiny that London even itself was sacked by them. And who did all these rank commotions point at, even at these two? Back at here and green with, with false uh. Tresillian, whom your grace we hear hath made chief justice. Well... Be it so. Mischief on mischief surely will shortly flow. Pardon my speech, my lord, since now we're all so brave to grace Queen Anne, this day we'll spend in sport. But in my t'other hose I'll tickle them for it. Come, come, ye don't, my lord. Don't, sir! Know ye to whom ye speak? No more. Good uncles. Come, sweet green, had done. I'll wring them all for this by England's crown. <clears throat> Why is our Lord Protector so outrageous? Because thy subjects have such outrage shown them by these thy flatterers. Let the sun dry up what the unwholesome fog have choked the ground with. Here's Arundel. Thy ocean's admiral hath brought thee home a rich and wealthy prize, taken three score sail of ships and six great carracks, all richly laden. Let those goods be sold to satisfy those borrowed sums of coin that their, their pride have forced from the needy commons to salve which inconvenience I beseech your grace. You would vouch safe to let me have the sale and distribution of those goods. A word. Good uncle is already past, which cannot, with our honour, be recalled. These wealthy prizes already are bestowed to these, our friends. On oh, them, oh, my lord! Yes! Who storms at it? Shall cankers eat the fruit that planting and good husbandry have nourished? Cankers? Ay, cankers, caterpillars. Worse than consuming fires, that eats up all their furies falls upon. Well, once more be still, huh? Who is that dares encounter with our will? We did bestow them. Hear me, kind uncles. We shall ere long be past protectorship. Then we will rule ourselves, and even till then, we let ye know those gifts are given to them. We did it, Woodstock. Hmm? Ye have done ill then. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dare you say so? <clears throat> dare I? 
Before oh. my God, I'll speak, King Richard, where I assured this day my head should off. I tell ye, sir, my allegiance stands accused in justice of the cause. Ye have done ill! The sun of mercy never shine on me, but I speak truth. When warlike Arundel, beset at sea, fought for those wealthy prizes he did with fame advance the English cross, still crying, Courage in King Richard's name! For thee he won them, and do thou enjoy them, he'll fetch more honours home. But had he known that kites should have enjoyed the eagle's prize, the fraught had swum unto thine enemies. No, sir. We'll soothe your vexed spleen, good uncle, and mend what is amiss. To those slight gifts not worth acceptance, thus much more we add. Hmm? Young Henry Green shall be Lord Chancellor. Oh, I can't. Keeper, Lord Keeper of our Privy Seal. Oh, oh, oh. Tresillian, learned in our kingdom's laws, you shall be Chief Justice what? by them and their directions, King Richard will uphold his government. Oh, change no more words, my lord. Ye do deject your kingly majesty to speak to such whose homespun judgment like their frosty beards would blast the blooming hopes of all your kingdom. Were I as you, my lord. Oh, gentle green, throw no more fuel on, but rather Seek to mitigate this heat. Be patient, kingly Richard. Quench this ire, which I had tears of force to stint this fire. This shrew the churls that make my queen so sad. By my grandsire Edward's kingly bones, my princely father's tomb. King Richard swears we'll make them weep these wrongs in bloody tears. Come, hmm? Fair Queen Anna Beam, Bagot and Green, keep by Richard's side. But as for you, we'll shortly make your stiff obedience bow. Remember this, my lords. We keep the seal. Our strength, you all shall know. <laughs> and we are Chancellor. We love you well, think so. God for his mercy, should we brook these braves? Disgraced and threatened us by fawning knaves? Shall we, that were great Edward's princely sons, be thus outbraved by flattering sycophants? For my God and only saints, I swear, but that my tongue have liberty to show the in the in passions boiling in my breast, I think my overburthened heart would break. What then may we conjecture? What's the cause of this remiss and inconsiderate dealing urged by the king and his confederates, but hate to virtue and a mind corrupt with all preposterous, rude misgovernment? These prizes, tamed by warlike Arundel, before his face are given those flatterers. It is his custom to be prodigal to any but the, to those who to those do best deserve. Because he knew you would bestow them well, he gave it such as for their private gain, neglect both honour and their country's good. Hello. <laughs> I know what noise is this? Some posts, it seems. Pray God, heaven, the news be good. Amen, I pray for England's happiness. Speak, speak. What tidings, Cheney? Of war, my lord, and civil dissension. The men of Kent and Essex do rebel. I thought no less and always feared as much. The Shreves in post have sent unto your grace that order be tain to stay the commons for fear rebellion rise in open arms. Now, headstrong Richard, shalt thou reap the fruit thy lewd licentious willfulness have sown. <laughs> I, I know not which way to bestow myself. 
There is no standing on delay, my lords. These hot eruptions must have some redress, or else in time they will grow incurable. The commons, they rebel, and the king, all careless, is wrong on wrong to stir more mutiny. <laughs> For, my God, I know not what to do. Take open arms, join with the vexed commons, and hail his minions from his wanton side. Their heads cut off, the people satisfied. No, not so, not so. Alack the day, good brother. May they not so affright the tender prince? We'll bear us nobly for the kingdom's safety and the king's honour. Therefore, list to me. Uh, you, brother Gaunt and noble Arundel, shall undertake by threats or fair entreaty to pacify the murmuring commons' rage. And whilst you there employ your service hours, will presently call a parliament and have their deeds examined thoroughly. Where, if by fair means we can win no favour, nor make King Richard leave their companies, we'll thus resolve for our dear country's good to right her wrongs, or for it spend our bloods. About it then. We for the commons, you for the court. Aye, aye. Good Lancaster, I pray, be careful. Uh, come, Brother York, we soon shall right all wrong and send some headless from the court ere long. Oh. Thus shall King Richard suit his princely train, despite his uncle's pride. Oh, embrace us, gentlemen. Uh, Sir Thomas Baggett, bushy, green, and screw. Your youth are fitting to our tender years, and such shall beautify our princely throne. Oh, fear not my uncles, nor their proudest strength, for I will buckler ye against them all. Thanks, dearest Lord. Let me have Richard's love, and like a rock unmoved, my state shall stand, scorning the proudest peer that rules the land. Your uncles seek to overturn your state, to awe you like a child that they alone may at their pleasure thrust you from their throne. As if the sun were forced to decline before his dated time of darkness comes. Sweet king, set courage to authority and let them know the power of majesty. May not the lion roar because he's young. What are your uncles but as elephants that set their aged bodies to the oak? You are the oak, against whose stock they lean. Fall from them once and then destroy them ever. Ugh. Be thou no stay, King Richard, to their strength, but as a tyrant unto tyranny, and so confound them all eternally. Law must extend unto severity when subjects dare to brave their sovereign. Mm, Tresillian, thou art Lord Chief Justice now. Mm? <laughs> Who should be learned in the laws but thee? Resolve us, therefore. What thinkst thou of them that under title of protectorship seek to subvert their king and sovereign? As of the king's rebellious enemies, as underminers of his sacred state, which in the greatest prince or mightiest peers that is, that is a subject to your majesty is nothing less than treason capital, and he's a traitor that endeavours it. Attain them then, arrest them and condemn them. Hail them to the block and cut off all their heads and then King Richard claim the government. See it be done, Tresillian, speedily. No, that course is all too rash, my gracious lord. <clears throat> too rash, rash for what? what? It must be done with greater policy for fear the people rise in mutiny. Aye, there is the fear. The commons love them well and all applaud the wily Lancaster, the counterfeit relenting Duke of York, together with our fretful uncle Woodstock, with greater mm. reverence than King Richard's self, but oh, time shall come when we shall yoke their necks and make them bend to our obedience. Mm. How now? Mm. What reads thou, Bushy? The monument of English chronicles, my lord, containing acts and memorable deeds of all your famous predecessor kings. Mm -hmm. What finds thou of them? 
Examples strange and wonderful, my lord, the end of treason, even in mighty persons. For here, tis said, your royal grandfather, although but young and under government, took the protector then, proud Mortimer, and on a gallows, 50 foot in height, he hung him for his pride and victory. Oh, why should our proud protector then presume, and we not punish him, whose treasons viler far than ever was rebellious Mortimer? Mm, prithee, read on. Examples such as these will bring us to our kingly grandsire's spirit. Uh, what's next? The battle, full of dread and doubtful fear, was fought twixt your father and the French. Hmm. Read on, we'll hear it. Then the Black Prince, encouraging his soldier, being in number 7,750, gave the onset to the French King's peasant army, which were numbered 68,000, and in one hour got the victory, slew 6,000 of the French soldiers, took prisoners of dukes, earls, knights, and gentlemen to the number 1,700, uh, and of the, the common sort, 10,000. So the prisoners were taken were twice so many as the Englishmen were in number. Besides, the thrice-renowned prince took with his own hand King John of France and his son prisoner. This was called the Battle of Poitiers and was fought on Monday, the 19th of September, 1363, my lord. A victory most strange and admirable. Never was conquest got with such great odds. Oh, princely Edward, had thy son such hap, such fortune and success to follow him, his daring uncles and rebellious peers does not control and govern as they do. But, but, hmm, these bright shining trophies shall awake me, and we are as his body's counterfeit, so will we be the image of his mind, hmm? and die, but will attain his virtuous deeds, hmm. Oh, what ensues next, good Bushy? Read the rest. Here is set down, my princely sovereign, the certain time and day when you were born. Our birthday, sayest thou. Is that noted there? It is, my lord. Pretty let me hear it. For thereby hangs a secret mystery, which yet our uncle strangely keeps from us. On, Bushy. Upon the 3rd of April, 1365, was Lord Richard, son of the Black Prince, born at Bordeaux. Hey, stay. Let me think a while. Um, read it again. Upon the 3rd of April, 1365, was Lord Richard, son to the Black Prince, born at Bordeaux. Dear 1365, what year is this? Uh, Tis now, my Lord, 1387. Um, <laughs> Oh, oh uh, by that account, the 3rd of April next, our age is numbered two and 20 years. Huh? Oh, <laughs> treacherous men that have deluded us. We might have claimed our right a 12 months since. Shut up thy book, good bushy bag at green. King Richard in his throne will now be seen. Oh, oh, this day, I'll claim my right, my kingdom's due. Our uncles well shall know, but they intrude, for which we will smite their base ingratitude. Edmund of Langley, Duke of York, my lord, sent from the Lord Protector and the peers, doth crave admittance to your royal presence. Oh, our uncle Edmund. So, were it not him, we would not speak with him, but go admit him. Woodstock and Gaunt are stern and troublesome, but York is gentle, mild and generous, and therefore we will admit his conference. He comes, my lord. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Methinks it's strange, my good and reverend uncle. You and the rest should thus malign against us, and every hour with rude and bitter taunts abuse King Richard and his harmless friends. We had a father that once called ye brother, a grandsire too, that titled you his son. But could they see how you have wronged King Richard? Their ghosts would haunt ye. And in dead of night, fright all your quiet sleeps with horrid fears. 
Oh, I pray. Stand up, huh? We honour reverent years in meaner subjects. Good uncle, rise! And tell us, what further mischiefs are there now devised to torture and afflict your sovereign with? My royal lord, even by my birth I swear, my father's tomb and faith to heaven I owe. Your uncle's thoughts are all most honourable, and to that end, the good protector sends me to certify your sacred majesty. The peers of England now are all assembled to hold a parliament at Westminster and humbly crave your highness would be there to sit in council touching such affairs as shall concern your country's government. Have they so soon procured a parliament without our knowledge too? It is somewhat strange. <laughs> Yet say, good uncle, we will meet them straight. The news to all will be most wished and welcome. I take my leave, and to your grace I swear, as I am subject loyal, just and true, will nothing do to hurt the realm, nor you. We shall believe you, good uncle. Go, attend him. Yes, we will meet them, but with such intent as shall dismiss their sudden parliament till we be pleased to summon and direct it. Come, sirs, to Westminster, attend our state. This day shall make ye ever fortunate. The third of April. Bushy, you know the time. Our age accomplished. Crown and kingdom's mine. Uh, ah, now, Brother York, what says uh, King Richard, huh? His Highness will be here immediately. Ah, uh, go, Cousin Surrey, uh, greet the Parliament. Tell them the King is coming. Give these petitions to the Knights and Burgesses of the Lower House, sent from several shire of all the Kingdom. Uh, these copies I will keep and show His Highness. Uh, uh, pr pray, make haste. Hello, my Lord. <sighs> Pity King Richard's youth, most reverend uncles, and in your high proceedings, gently use him. Think of his tender years. What is now amiss, his riper judgment shall make good and perfect to you and to the kingdom's benefit. Black, sweet king, queen, you and our lord the king have little cause to fear our just proceedings. We'll fall beneath his feet and bend our knees, so he cast off those hateful flatterers that daily ruinate his state and kingdom. Uh, go in, uh, sweet uh, ladies, comfort one another. Uh, this happy parliament shall make all even and plant sure peace betwixt the king and realm. And may heaven direct your wisdoms to provide for England's honour and King Richard's good. Believe no less, sweet queen. Attend, her highness. The king is come, my lords. Stand from the door, then. Make way, Cheney. Yonder's your uncle, my lord. Mm, aye, with our plain protector, full of complaining, sweet green, I'll wage my crown. Give them fair words and smooth a while. The toils are pitched, and you may catch them quickly. Why, how now, uncle? What, disrobed again of all your golden rich habiliments? Aye, aye, good cuz. I'm now in my tupper hose. <laughs> I'm now my plain self, plain Thomas, and by the rood in these plain hose, I'll do the realm more good than these that pill the poor to jet in gold. Nay, be not angry, uncle. Be you then pleased, good cuz, to hear me speak, and view thy subject's sad petitions. See here, King Richard, while thou livest at ease, lulling thyself in nice security, thy wronged kingdom's in a mutiny. From every province other people come, with open mouths, exclaiming on the wrongs thou and these upstarts have imposed on them. Shame is deciphered on thy palace gate. Confusion hangeth o'er thy wretched head. Mischief is coming, and in storms must fall. The oppression of the poor to heaven doth call. Well, well, good uncle, these your bitter taunts against my friends and me will one day cease. But what's the reason you have sent for us? Hmm? To have your grace confirm this parliament 
and set your hand to certain articles most needful for your state and kingdom's quiet. Mm. Where are those articles? The states and burgesses of the parliament attend with duty to deliver them. Please, you ascend your throne. We'll call them in. Mm. Uh, we'll ask a question first, and then we'll see them. For trust me, reverend uncles, we have sworn we will not sit upon our royal throne until this question be resolved at full. Uh, reach me that paper, Bushy. Mm -hmm. Hear me, princes. We had a strange petition here delivered us. A poor man's son, his father being deceased, gave him in charge unto a rich man's hands to keep him and the little land he had until he attained to uh, 21 years. The poor revenue amounts to yeah, three crowns. And yet the insatiate churl <laughs> denies his right and bars him of his fair inheritance. Oh, tell me, I pray, <clears throat> will not our English laws enforce this rich man to resign his due? There is no let to bar it, gracious sovereign. For my God, sweet prince, it joys my soul to see your grace in person, thus to judge his cause. Such deeds as this will make King Rich shine above his famous predecessor kings, if thus he labour to establish right. <laughs> the poor man then had wrong. You all confess. And shall have right, my liege, to quit his wrong. Then, Woodstock, give us right. For we are wronged. Thou art the rich, and we the poor man's son. The realms of England, France, and Ireland are those three crowns thou yearly keep from us. It's not a wrong when every mean man's son may take his birthright at the time expired, and we, the principal, being now attained, almost to two and twenty years of age, cannot be suffered to enjoy our own, nor peaceably possess our father's right. Was this the trick, sweet prince? Alack the day you need not thus have doubled with your friends. The right I hold, even with my heart, I render, and wish your grace had claimed it long ago. Thou'st rid mine age of mickle care and woe, and yet I think I have not wronged your birthright. For if times were searched, I guess your grace is not so full of years till April next. But, be it as it will, lo! Here, King Richard, I thus yield up my sad protectorship. No, Heavy burthen thou hast thou ta'en from me. Long mayest thou live in peace and keep thine own, that truth and justice may attend thy throne. Then in the name of heaven we thus ascend it, and here we claim our fair inheritance of fruitful England, France and Ireland, superior lord of Scotland and the rights belonging to our great dominions. Here, uncles, take the crown from Richard's hand and once more place it on our kingly head. This day, we will be new in Thronership. With all our hearts, my lord, trumpets be ready. Long live King Richard, of that name the second, the sovereign lord of England's ancient rights. Long, Long live, live King Richard. Richard! Long live King Richard! We thank you all. So now we feel ourselves. <laughs> Our body could not fill this chair till now. It was scanted to us by protectorship. But now we let you know King Richard rules and will elect and choose, place and displace such officers as we ourselves shall like of. And first, my lords, because your age is such as pity twere ye should be further pressed with weighty business of the Commonweal, we here dismiss ye from the council table 
And will that you remain not in our court? Deliver up your staves. And hear ye, Arundel, <laughs> we do discharge ye of the Admiralty. Scroot, take his office and his place in council. I thank your highness. Here, take my staff, good cousin. York thus leaves thee. Thou leanest on staves that will at length deceive thee. Ah! Lie the burthen of old Lancaster. And may he perish that succeeds my place. So, sir, we will observe your humour. Sir Henry Green, succeed our uncle York, and Bushy, take the staff of Lancaster. Pah! I thank your grace. His curses affright not me. I'll keep it to defend your majesty. What transformations do mine eyes behold, as if the world were topsy-turvy turned. Hear me, King Richard. Plain Thomas, I I'll not hear ye. Ye do not well to move his majesty. Hence, flatterer, or by my soul, I'll kill thee. Shall England, that so long was governed by grave experience of white-haired age, be subject now to rash, unskillful boys? And let force the sun, run backward to the east, lay Atlas burthen on a pygmy's back, appoint the sea his times to ebb and flow, and that as easily may be done as this. Give up your council staff. We'll hear no more. My staff, King Richard. Here it comes. <laughs> Here it is. Full ten years space within a prince's hand, a soldier and a faithful counsellor. This staff hath always been discreetly kept, nor shall the world report an upstart groom did glory in the honours Woodstock lost, and therefore, Richard, us I sever it. There. Let him take it. Shivered, cracked, and broke, as will the state of England be ere long by thus rejecting true nobility. Farewell, King Richard, Alter Plashy brothers. If you ride through Essex, call and see me. If once the pillars and supporters quail, how can the strongest castle choose but fail? So will he so ere long. Yeah, Come, 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 let's, come. Leave, leave, them. let's them. leave them. Aye, aye, your places are supplied sufficiently. Oh, the doting grey beards. <laughs> for my, for God, my lord, had they not been your uncles, I'd break my council staff about their heads. We'll have an act for this. It shall be henceforth counted high treason for any fellow with a grey beard to come within 40 foot of the castle gates. Oh, war, great belly, doublet. We'll alter the kingdom presently. Poxant, we'll not have a beard amongst us. We'll shave the country and the city too, shall we not, Richard? Mm, yeah, do what you will. We'll shield and buckle ye. We shall have a guard of archers to attend us, and they shall daily wait on us and you. Send plock, plock. Send proclamations straight in Richard's name to bridge the laws our late protector made. Let some be sent to seek Tresillian forth. Seek him. Hang him. He lurks not far off, I warrant. And this news come abroad once ye shall have him here presently. Would he will come, his counsel would direct you well. Troth, I think I shall trouble myself but with a few counsellors. What cheer shall we have to dinner, King Richard? <laughs> No matter what today, we'll mend it shortly. The hall at Westminster shall be enlarged and serve us only for a dining room, huh? wherein I'll daily feast 10,000 men. An excellent device. The commons has murmured against us a great while, and there's no such means as meat to stop their mouths. But make their gate wider. Let's first fetch their money and bid them to dinner afterwards. Splud, and I were not a counsellor, I could find it in me to dine at a tavern today, sweet king. Shall's be merry. We must have money to buy new suits, my lord. The fashions that we wear are gross and stale. We'll go sit in council to devise some new. A special purpose to be thought on. It shall be the first thing we do. Oh, come, wantons, come. If Gloucester hear of this, he'll say our council guides us much amiss. 
Dismiss the Parliament, our uncles called, and tell the peers it is our present pleasure that each man parts unto his several home. When we are pleased, they shall have summons sent, and with King Richard hold a Parliament. Set forward. You of the council march before the king. I will support his arm. Gramercy, Green. Tell me, dear aunt, has Richard so forgot the types of honour and nobility so to disgrace his good and reverend uncles? Madam, tis true. No sooner had he claimed the full possession of his government, but my dear husband and his noble brethren were all dismissed from the council table, banished the court, and even before their faces, their offices bestowed on several grooms. My husband Ireland, that unloving lord, God pardon his amiss, he now is dead. King Richard was the cause he left my bed. No more, good cousin. Could I work the means I should not so disgrace his dearest friends? Alack the day, though I am England's queen, I meet sad hours and wake when others sleep. He meets content, but care with me must keep. Distressed poverty o'erspreads the kingdom. In Essex, Surrey, Kent, and Middlesex are 17,000 poor and indignant, which I numbered, and to help their wants, my jewels and my plate are turned to coin and shared amongst them. O oh, righteous Richard, O oh, heavy blame is thine for this distress that dost allow thy polling flatterers to gild themselves with others' miseries. Wrong not yourself with sorrow, gentle queen, unless that sorrow were a helping means to cure the malady you sorrow for. The sighs I vent are not mine own, dear aunt. I do not sorrow in mine own behalf, nor do repent with peevish forwardness, and wish I ne'er had seen this English shore, but think me happy in King Richard's love. No, no, good aunt. This troubles not my soul, tis England's subject sorrow I sustain. I fear they grudge against their sovereign. I fear not that, madam. England's not mutinous, tis peopled all with subjects, not with outlaws. Though Richard, much misled by flatterers, neglects and throws his scepter carelessly, yet none dares rob him of his kingly rule. Besides your virtuous charity, fair queen, so graciously hath won the commoner's love, mm. as only you have power to stay their rigor. The wealth I have shall be the poor's revenue, as surest were confirmed by Parliament. This mine own industry, and sixty more I daily keep at work, is all their own. The coin I have, I send to them, which were more to satisfy my fears or pay those sums my wanton lord hath forced from needy subjects, I'd want myself. Go look those trunks be filled with those our labours to relieve the poor. Let them be carefully distributed. For those that now shall want, we'll work again and tell them ere two days we shall be furnished. Why, is the court removing? Whither goes that trunk? This is the Queen's charity, sir, of needful clothing to be distributed amongst the poor. Aye, there's one blessing yet, that England hath a virtuous queen, although a wanton king. Good health, sweet princess. Believe me, madam, you have quick utterance for your husserfry. Your grace affords good pennyworth, sure ye sell so fast. Uh, pray heaven your gettings quit your safe return. Amen, for tis from heaven I look for recompense. No doubt, fair queen, the righteous powers will quit you for these religious deeds of charity. Uh, but to my message. Uh, madam, my lord the duke entreats your grace prepare with him to horse. He will this night ride home to Plashy House. Madam, ye hear I'm sent for. Then be gone. Leave me alone in desolation. Oh, dear good aunt, I'll see you shortly there. 
King Richard's kindred are not welcome here. Will ye all leave me then? Oh, woe is me. I uh, now am crowned a queen of misery. Where didst thou leave my husband, Cheney? Speak. Accompanied with the Dukes of York and Lancaster, who, as I guess, intend to ride with him, for which he wished me haste your grace's presence. Thou seest, the passions of the queen are such, I may not too abruptly leave her highness, but tell my lord I'll see him presently. So thou, King Richard, Cheney, prithee, tell me what revels keep his flattering minions? <sighs> Uh, they sit in council to devise strange fashions and suit themselves in wild and antic habits such as the kingdom never yet beheld. French hose, Italian cloaks, and Spanish hats. Polonian shoes, with peaks a handful long, tied to their knees, with chains of pearl and gold, their plumed tops fly waving in the air, a cupid high above their wanton heads. Tresillion with King Richard likewise sits, devising taxes and strange shifts for money to build again the hall at Westminster to feast in. And when abroad they come, Four hundred archers in a guard attend them. Oh, certain ruin of this famous kingdom. Fond Richard, thou built'st a hall to feast in, and starves to thy wretched subjects to erect it. Woe to those men that thus incline thy soul to these remorseless acts and oh, deeds so foul. <laughs> oh. The trumpets tell us that the King Richard's coming. I'll take my leave, fair queen, but credit me, ere many days again, I'll visit you. I'll home to Langley with my uncle York, and there lament alone my wretched state. Bless heaven conduct ye both. Queen Anne alone, for Richard's follies, still must sigh and groan. And thus we come to the end of the session it's 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 lovely that it was it was it was like everyone was sort of all going into the next scene even though we're not going into the next scene today but it's good I, I like that there was that sense of continuity and flow and it's a shame that we're stopping here but we are um so uh well done everyone some lovely lovely stuff going on there um uh, for those who want to just do a smooth transition into the rest of the play uh skip to the next video now uh unless this is going out today on the day that we're doing this one in which case the next one won't be out yet because we haven't done it yet but anytime in the future if this is in the future, you can just skip to the next one. You'll, you can just go straight in. It'll, it'll be, uh, maybe we'll do an omnibus. We won't, but maybe we will. We won't, but maybe we will. Um, uh, so um, lots and lots and lots of things uh, coming out of that. It's interesting structurally. Um, uh, I almost didn't place this final scene here. I almost said we'd start next time with it. Um, I didn't because of the numbers of who were in the room, but there, there, there's almost a sense of a, the first act is over in the uh, after that big uh, balance of power shifting scene. And then we sort of have this reintroduction to what's happened since the king's been doing some stuff. Um, and the scene that's about to follow next would be the king doing some stuff, uh, having uh, having been king for a while. And we see what that's like. So um, it. it in that sense of sort of thinking of it, of it in that sort of three three act structure rather than five, um, it, it sort of that flows quite nicely. Um, okay, thoughts from the room. Um, I mean, it's that question of characters. We've been doing some workshops on this, um, and and how 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 are we enjoying it so far. Uh, going to Lynn first. Yeah, I um, I think Gloria made some very interesting choices in the first scene in which Richard appears. Uh, I have long believed that um, that yelling on stage actually weakens a character. Uh, anger actually is a sign of weakness. And the fact that Richard was had this sort of flippant almost attitude and Woodstock was the one that was getting upset, I think uh, um, tilted that power dynamic in Richard's favor because 
I don't care, I'm the king. I don't care because I don't have to. And, uh, and um, Woodstock was a little less in control of the situation there. So I mean, we talked in wood workshop about how complicated that dynamic is, like who's on top. And, and that was a really interesting way to look at it, that, that, uh, that Richard was actually a little more, had a little more sang froid than uh, Woodstock did. Yeah, it was interesting when I was prepping Woodstock of just going, right, wh at what point does he explode? Where, where, where does he pull himself back? And uh, trying to find those beats. Don't think I found them, actually, but um, just uh, that sort of question was there. I, I really love what Gloria was doing as well. Gloria, how was, how was King Richard for you as the first part in Richard's Well, um, firstly, apologies. No, am I, oh, I am unmuted. God, sorry about that. I thought, I thought Alexander... It's all right. No, that it was great. Happened. Like It's fine. Nobody will know what we're oh, really? talking about. Shall I not say? Yeah, it won't be there. Oh, I'll, okay. I'll cut that. Well, I just want to thank Alexandra because she was so generous and like tried to give me an option. And I thought she was like being really in, in the scene. And I was like, this is amazing. Like she's interrupting, like I can feed off it. And so I was like, so I did some more acting, but then I was still the thing that no one will know what we're talking about anyway. So thank you very much. Um, and yeah, it was, um, Oh, what a, what a part, Whoa, so good. It's hard, isn't it? Um, uh, oh gosh, so much to say really, but what's useful? I think that, you know, he has been, <laughs> you know, nobody puts Richard in a corner. Like, I, I, just, I just think like he spent his whole life, you know, but this is a, this is a man who at 14 years of age stood in front of rebels who, you know, who wanted him, wanted, not him, but, you know, the, the archbishop, uh, the bishop and the, the chancellor and stuff. And he basically managed to kind of dispel, you know, that the whole peasants revolt at 14 years of age. He said, he went there and he said, I am your king. Will you know, will you follow me? And he just kind of led them out like the Pied Piper away from the incident where what Tyler had been. So, so, so yes, he's young. Yes, he's been crushed by his uncles for so long um, and has, you know, his dad and his granddad to kind of live up to. But he also believes that he, that God has made him king, right? So he's not just any old kind of 20 year old. Um, I could go on. I'll shut up now. No, I, what I really liked was also how well realized his mates were. Um, all of his his pack around you were were, were really really nice. Um, yeah, Liza and Dan, um, uh, uh, how, 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 and uh, and Lynn as well. You know, uh, and uh, and Scroop to a lesser degree. Scroop feels like he's the he's he's the band. He's he, he feels more like a roadie um, to this this particular guy. There's definitely a pecking order here, isn't there? Who wants to leap in? <laughs> Uh, Alexandra. I wanted to leap in really quickly because yes, there's there's definitely a pecking order, and it's it, it green is definitely at the top, uh, Tresillian is definitely at the bottom. He's not Im as important as as those four. He's just there to kind of um, help them out, and it's re it was really interesting to kind of try and figure out between the other three who's on the top when or who's who's got attention, the king's attention more. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that would be me, obviously. Um, uh, and uh, Baggett's disagreeing. <laughs> well, you know, he can he can have his own opinion, but it's wrong. Um, I was, uh, you know, I was trying to resist the temptation to play camp. I gay, therefore evil is a really dangerous trope, but it is written so with such wit and such biting, like, you know, you, uh, I don't know. Anyway, Green is really loving this. This is by far my favorite type of role to play. It's the one I'm usually typecast as, in fact, is the sycophant follower who's always just too happy to be in power and is now showing it off as long as he pals around with the, with the king or whoever it is here. Um, I do think that Liza is correct, Alex, Alexandra is correct, that this is this is really written to be, um, I guess, showing off and um, relishing in relishing in the moment. Yeah. And that I, the comments that were being made in the chat about who's in power, um, the one who's shouting is is not essentially. Certainly, we don't need to show anything because hey, we're we're with the king, so we've got the we've got the fancy duds. Mm. 
I, yeah. I feel. Uh, Lynn, then Gloria. Oh. Yeah, um, it's it, it might be for doubling reasons, but I find it a little odd that Bushy doesn't appear with Baggett and Green the first time they show up, but that's the way that is. Uh, so, you know, I, I was groping a little to kind of figure out the, his place in the dynamic. I kind of think that rather than part of the hierarchy, he's a little bit off on the side. And I love that he gets to be like, Oh, I'm the intellectual. I'm reading a book of history. Oh, look here. Says you're almost 22. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, he's got that all planned out ahead of time, I'm sure. Like, oh, yes, I'm the scholar and I'm reading this book while I'm also half listening to your conversation. Oh, look what it says here. That was pretty fun. Yeah, do we do we think he wears glasses with just uh, clear clear lenses? They're not actually, you know, you know, he, he doesn't right, right. need them at all. They're just a, a, a prop. Gloria, um... no, it was just a it was just a point on the shouting thing. I, reading it and 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 being in that world, I feel like Richard uh, screams into a lot of silk pillows. I, I feel like he, in terms of like the rage and the shouting and stuff, I feel like he spends a lot of time screaming into pillows. Silk ones. That's all. Thank you. It's 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 it, well, it's a good technique before you come on stage, isn't it? You're just having the wing. Um, <laughs> um, Eric. Well, Lynn mentioned that like sort of uh, Bushy felt a bit like sort of a side character, but then like he's the most important one. Like it's he's kind of like the one who kind of sets the ball in motion, basically. Like, oh yeah, I can take power right now. I don't need to wait for like another year or something for that to happen. So it's kind of like that, that kind of is what gets into Richard's head. And as for Scroop, I feel like he's sort of, I, I'm just worried that he becomes like the sort of admiral. So he's probably like the bouncer <laughs> or something. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, are the thoughts along those lines? Um, I, uh, sh shall we talk about the, the, the oh, Alan? Yeah, I was just thinking on this question of the date of birth, um, there is a, there is an interesting question as to whether what's being said to Richard is actually the truth, um, or whether there is um, the exaggeration, because certainly modern history would, or modern historical records would seem to suggest that he was born in 1367 rather than 65, which means he was not rising 22, he was rising 20. Yes, so when Woodstock says, um, you know, I'm, I'm sure it's not till April. Um, I've, got a, I've got a card and everything. Um, uh, is, is that maybe that's actually true. Um, and he's not been deceiving them. I mean, that's, that's actually quite a big qu question for a, for a production to decide is are the uncles actually, actually manipulating uh, the situation? Or is it all, um, are they working in good faith? I think that's a good segue into the uncles. Um, how are we feeling about them? Uh, how was it? How was it to be an uncle? Um, and uh, and how 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 was that fl uh, flowing for people? Helen, I have speeches that would be made, some of which I know by heart. But this guy, this guy has Lancaster has such a history. And, and his descendants, such a future. I felt the weight of history bearing down on me the whole time. Uh, uh, other thoughts? Uh, York, Lancaster, or, or Woodstock? Um... Well, from, from my point of view, I found it quite a tricky uh, rope to balance on because quite a bit of the characterization seemed to be that York was the one who was trying to keep the wheels on the wagon as far as possible. And, um, you know, I was al almost sitting there mouthing at both Woodstock and Lancaster, for goodness sake, calm down, dear. You know, There's something cool it. About that scene with York going to Richard and Richard making him wait, and then you mm. know down he goes on his knees and oh get up, get up, and it's the way the that the York is playing that role because of course he knows why he's there, he knows yeah. what they are trying to do because they're sort of trying to stitch him up, 
Um, but so there's a question of is is York playing the game of being very obsequious at that point because he, they need Richard to turn up to Parliament, uh, or is that just to his true deferential self? So there, there is a question of, to a degree, how he's playing that and the performative nature of what they do. Yeah, and and is York actually being played as the patsy for by his two brothers? Well, they seem to they seem in the play to confer. I think we've got to be careful not to talk about the historical figures rather than uh, who are much very different in so many ways um, is, you know, uh, you know, they do seem to defer a lot to Woodstock. Um, mm. Woodstock does seem to be making the plans and then it's a question of how well those plans are executed. So that's interesting. Um, I mean, I'm not entirely sure and it isn't completely clear in the play why Woodstock is the protector and not one of the other two brothers. He, he's, he's half I mean, I would have considered younger. I would have considered that Lancaster would have been the appropriate person to have been in charge. But also mm. probably the person who everyone would not allow to be in charge. Um, I, I, well, I, I think I agree. again we're dipping into actual real history. Um, yeah. The nature of what Lancaster was like in real life, um, uh, and, and, and you you don't want to give him any more power if you can avoid it. Um, uh, other thoughts? We're going to be closing the session in just a moment. Uh, but yes, uh, just a note for everyone who's returning to their characters across the week, um, either with a break or uh, or, or uh, continuously, is uh, hold on to any thoughts about how they've been now yeah, as to where they will be tomorrow and uh, the day after. Uh, so do hang on to those thoughts. Any final thoughts from the room before I close the session? Anyone want to leap in? Anyone feel they're underrepresented? Uh, I see Eric. I'm not underrepresented, but I mean, it was, uh, well, I know, yeah. Uh, the, uh, the scene with the queens was quite interesting, with the queen and the duchesses was quite interesting, and we haven't talked about that, I feel, but I don't know if, um, yeah, it was just like sort of this sort of so solidarity among women, when all the men are just like busy ru ruining the country. Yeah, Queen Anne's had a terrible time. Uh, it's like you've stepped into this, this whole can of worms, and what do you do tomorrow? Um, try and be competent when my husband isn't. And compassionate, which is lovely about her, that she sells her own luxury goods to, to generate money to help people. I, I got the sense that she was trying to redeem his soul in a way to, to counterbalance uh, what he was doing. Mm. Yeah, it, it strikes me that she, she even has a line about um, these people are leading him astray. So she, it's not that she's, she's saying she doesn't love him or she's not, you know, blaming him for it. She is, she is just saying he's young and these people are leading him astray and they're influencing him in a way that isn't good. And so all I can do is do the charitable stuff that I'm doing behind the scenes because that's what a queen does. Mm. Uh, Lois. Yeah, I thought that scene had quite a nice atmosphere. I mean, you get the sense that uh, uh, Woodstock's household is kind of relaxed sort of place where people feel comfortable. Uh, you know, at least this lot, you know, and that there, there's more kind of uh, pleasant humor in it as opposed to sarcasm and uh, uh, kind of twirling of mustaches and so on. Mm. And we have this 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 presence of the Duchess of Ireland, who is is is, is there to sort of remind you know bad bad, bad stuff can happen to people uh, 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 people, um, and uh, yeah, there's there's a, a that's that's complex. Uh, Elizabeth, and then I think I saw Rachel. Well, my comment's not about the play; it's about the actors. I loved the costumes, especially the crowns. Every time we got an even more, more beautiful crown, Tamara's crown was off the hook. It was amazing. And I loved Rob's cravat and Helen's costume, all the costumes, Alexandra's costume, they were fantastic. They really made the text today. Thank you. Um, it's uh, a pity they didn't make, I mean, it was sort of mix and match. 
<laughs> well, you know, we, we, we do what we can. We do what we can. Um, I don't think we're going for a consistent era aesthetic here at all. Um, <laughs> Rachel. Uh, no, I was just going to say uh, what Lois said that um, Woodstock's house for to, that being the place for such an intimate scene, like, you know, there's a lot of things that are very, even though this scene is political, it's kind of, there kind of is a little bit of a, a pullback and it's not, uh, I think is a, official um, in capacity as, as the rest of the, the rest of the stuff. Um, and I think it's also, it, it's also, um, th these are all women that are our family, but I think by marriage and it's also the, um, I don't know that there is that like cohesion, but there was also a part in there when she was talking about Richard and that, I, and I was pleading my case as the Duchess of Ireland that I was thinking she doesn't understand the what's happened like that or that the position she doesn't have the power to rectify the I don't know the social order that's kind of being brought down by uh, by Richard I don't know this is a very meaty play and there's so much like to to like dissect even in like just this that we've covered and in that workshop yesterday it's so it's so there's so much there's so much to turn to turn around i think is that yeah it's a, a really really just love this play um so much good stuff okay i'm going to close the session now we'll be returning tomorrow with uh more in the uh thomas and woodstock goodness um uh, uh so all that remains thank all the readers performers today and goodbye Bye. Bye. <laughs>